Mr. Chairman, you can go ahead and take roll if you want to. We'll get the meeting of the BZA meeting for April 16th, 2020 started. Okay, I'm gonna call this meeting to order and we'll do a verbal roll call to establish uh, a quorum. So if I call your name, uh, please uh, unmute your uh, computer or your phone and announce your presence. Ms. Davis. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ms. Carpenter. Sam here, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Pepper. I'm present, good afternoon. And to you and Mr. Lawless. I am present and good afternoon to all. Great, so we have established that uh, a quorum is present. I will turn it back to Ms. Lamb. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. The Metropolitan Board of Zoning Appeals is now in session for the regularly scheduled meeting of April 16th, 2020. My name is Emily Lamb, and I will be presenting the cases to the board for their review in today's public hearing. We are convened electronically pursuant to Governor Lee's Executive Order Number 16 in order to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak and still conduct essential business of the metropolitan government. Before we move on with the meeting, the governor's executive order requires a motion to proceed electronically, so staff would solicit a vote related to that at this point. All right, we'll move. I will move that we uh, meet electronically. If you would like to second, please have the I'll second. All right, have a second. And who is that? Um, this, I believe that was Mr. Lawless. Mr. Lawless. Okay. And, and, uh, Chairman, Chairman Taylor, this is Quan Poole from the Metro Legal Department. Um, one thing that we have suggested that boards um, add in as a part of part of the motion is that, um, in addition to protecting the health and health, safety, and well-being of, of any Tennesseans, we also add that if there's any current board rule or policy that would conflict with the board meeting electronically, that that board rule uh, is suspended so long as the executive. Um, the governor's executive order number 16 is in place. Um, it, you know, in other words, there are some part of y'all's rule that require people to be present and, and to take these things live in person, though that rule or any rule to that effect would also be suspended until the governor's order is, uh, uh, is lifted. And I will gladly incorporate that into the motion. Um, and I'll second it. Okay, and that was Mr. Lawless. And we will do a roll call vote uh, just for the record uh, on this, unless there is any discussion. If there's discussion, uh, please press the hand raise button on your phone or your computer. All right, seeing none, uh, Ms. Davis. I'm present. And how do you vote on that motion? I vote yes. Yes, Ms. Carpenter. Uh, yes. Mr. Pepper. I vote in favor. And Mr. Lawless. In favor. And I vote in favor also that motion's unanimous and it passes, we will have an electronic meeting. Ms. Lamb. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. In order to convene this meeting pursuant to that executive order, board members are participating remotely and we encourage members of the public to submit comments in support or opposition to the board electronically at bza at nashville.gov. We extended the deadline to submit comments and any comments received by 12 noon yesterday, Wednesday, April 15th, were provided to the board for consideration prior to the hearing. Any comments received after 12 noon yesterday will be read into the record. I am here at the Sunny West Conference Room at a station that has been set up for anyone who wishes to address the board and social distant measures have been implemented. Uh, we have some hand sanitizer at the podium, so I believe we are all sufficiently socially distanced and sanitized. For these public hearings, the board reviews the correspondence submitted in support of and opposition to these cases. The board also reviews correspondence and recommendations from other government agencies in preparation for the hearing. In today's hearing, staff will present the site plans, maps, photographs, and other documents that comprise the, state, the case record. At the conclusion of the staff presentation, the appellant will present his or her case to the board. After the appellant's presentation, if anyone is here wishing to speak in support of the appeal, they may do so. If any opposition is present, the board will then hear from those parties. After the opposition presents its testimony, the appellant will have a period for rebuttal. According to the BZA rules, the appellant has five minutes for presentation if no opposition is present. In contested cases, the BZA rules allow 10 minutes for each side to present testimony. 
Should the appellant wish to provide rebuttal testimony, the appellant should reserve some portion of the allotted 10 minutes. At the conclusion of each hearing, the board will deliberate telephonically and then vote on that case. The board is vested with the power to act on these cases under the provisions of the Metro Zoning Code, Section 1740-180. All section numbers that we refer to today come from the Metro Zoning Code, which applies to the entire jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Government. The Zoning Code was adopted by the Metro Council and became effective on January 1st, 1998. I will introduce the entire Zoning Code and make it a part of today's record. The Metro Code requires a record of these proceedings. Because BZA meetings are recorded for the Metro Nashville Network and because the board is hearing these cases telephonically, it is imperative that anyone addressing the board come forward to the podium here at the Sunny West Conference Room and speak into the microphone that's at that podium. All speakers should identify themselves by name and address and then make the desired presentation. The Metro Code requires four members of our seven member board to establish a quorum. The code also requires at least four affirmative votes to grant an appeal. In the event that five or more members are present, but the appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within 30 days of the public hearing will be deemed denied by operation of law. Pursuant to board rules, an aggrieved party may appeal board decisions to Chancery or Circuit Court within 60 days of the entry of a BZA order. Additionally, as per the BZA rules, an aggrieved party may file a motion for rehearing by the BZA within 60 days of the original hearing date. After that time elapses, the board's decision becomes final and no further action can be taken. If your appeal is granted, you are required to obtain the permit for which you applied. A permit must be obtained within two years for board approval to remain valid. It should also be noted that if false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board approval could be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing before the BZA. Mr. Chairman, I submit that all cases have been filed in proper order, all appellants have been notified by certified mail, and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled. I do have some preliminary announcements regarding deferrals and withdrawals. First case 2020-038 has been deferred to May 21st. Case 2020-061 has been deferred to May 21st. Case 2020-066 has been deferred to May 7th. Case 2020-072 has been deferred to May 7th. Case 2020-079 has been withdrawn. And finally, case 2020-088 has been deferred to May 7th. The general announcement regarding BZA cases during this time that we are meeting telephonically, all item A and item D appeals will be deferred until we are able to meet in person. At this point, the governor's executive order allowing telephonic meetings expires on May 18th. If that is not extended, we would likely meet in person on May 21st. But of course, as with all things these days, that is subject to change. We will notify the board and the public at the earliest possible time when we have dates for those cases. For the members of the public, our board utilizes a consent agenda at each of its meetings. One board member reviews the record for each case prior to the hearing and identifies those cases which meet the criteria for the requested action by the appellant. If the reviewing board member determines that, that testimony in the case would not alter the material facts in any substantial way, the case is recommended for the, to the board for approval. The consent agenda was recently published, um, so anyone wishing to pull an item from consent can do so could do so electronically. We received uh, one request to pull a case from consent. That case has since been deferred so that the applicants can speak with the opposition and will be heard at a later date. However, as previously stated, we are here at the station set up at the Sunny West Conference Room for anyone wishing to appear in person to pull an item from the consent agenda. To that end, we'll enter into the record those cases that have been recommended, and if anyone is here in opposition to it, to the one case that has been recommended for consent, we will remove the case from the consent agenda and hear it in its regular order. Mr. Chairman, the one case recommended for consent agenda is case 2020-099, involving property at 805 40th Avenue North. This is a request for a variance from front setback requirements to construct a two-family dwelling. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 99? There is no one here in opposition to case 99, that is the sole case on the consent agenda. So Mr. Chairman, staff would solicit a vote from the board at this time. All right, there's a motion for the consent agenda. Is there a second, please, to raise your hand button? Anyone, Mr. Lawless? 
Move, I second it. Uh, there's a motion, there's a second on the floor. Is there any discussion? If so, hit your raise hand button. Seeing none, uh, we'll take a vote and start with Mr. Lawless. Aye. Mr. Pepper? Aye. Uh, Ms. Karpinek? Uh, in favor. And Ms. Davis? In favor. Uh, I'll vote in favor also that motion passes, uh, consent agenda passes. Members of the public, if your case was just approved on the consent agenda, please give our staff until Monday to process the documentation associated with your appeal. At that point, you can pursue the permits for which you have applied. There are no council members present, Mr. Chairman, so at this point, absent any other announcements, we're ready to proceed with the cases to be heard. All right, first case. Give me one second, working on getting my presentation going. The first case for the board to consider today is case 2020-049. This is a request for a variance from garage door orientation requirements to construct a single family residence. The case will likely recall hearing this case at a previous date. Um, at that point, it was deferred that the applicant could contact this council member. The applicant, Mr. Crockett, is here today to address the board. I will briefly refresh your recollection. The zoning map here shows you the zoning is R6A. This is the aerial photography giving you a sense of the property and surrounding areas. This is the site plan submitted by the applicant. And finally, the area, of, I'm sorry, the site visit, photos from the site visit showing the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 49? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Chairman, the applicant is here and ready to address the board. Great. Um, if you would, sir, if you would state your name and address and tell us um, while you're here, uh, but I guess that which is we have heard this case before, um, and I'm not sure if everybody that's um, present today has heard this case, but I know you've been before our board, and as we left the case, um, you were to go back and uh, talk with the council member and uh, neighbors, uh, et cetera, and we got a letter from the council member yesterday saying that he hadn't heard from you. Um, so if you could tell us um, again, the purpose of your being here and then what the status is with meeting with your council. All right, I'll do that. Yeah, I'm a, uh, I have a statement. I'll just read it all. Identify yourself by name. Oh, sorry, James Crockett, 1822 Delta Avenue, Nashville. So, like you said, we attended a uh, previous B BZA meeting. Um, you all deferred us to the councilman, Freddie O'Connell. Um, I contacted Freddie O'Connell. He actually did not deny my request, but he deferred us to the Historic Buena Vista Design Committee. And uh, I actually received an a mess a email from them yesterday, and they actually does not do not support uh, me having a front-facing garage. Um, and that's why I'm back here, uh, and I actually want to present more of my case. Um, so basically I was, uh, I went and read, read the, uh, code of ordinance. It basically, uh, if you look at 1712-020 in the district bulk regulations, uh, for the A, you know, R6A, RS5A, uh, R8A, they mention on A, access and driveways, where exists, access shall be from an improved alley only. Where no improved alley exists, one driveway within the street may be permitted. Um, then on B, it mentions a, about a garage, attached garage, the garage door shall face the side and rear of the property line. So um, section A addresses the driveways where an approved alley does not exist. However, section B does not 
address the garages that do not have side or rear access. Um, and Section A states that we can have a driveway in the front of the house because it says where no approved alley exists, one driveway within the street may be permitted. Um, I know that doesn't uh, refer to a front-facing garage, but I just wanted to bring that up also. Um, a front-facing garage is our best option for the lot for the following reasons. As you know, the lot is landlocked on three sides, which prohibits alleyway entrance or side entrance. Uh, ex exclusion of front-facing garage would pose a safety risk for the owners. Cheatham, the Cheatham Place Road, the street in front of the lot, uh, is is narrow when the cars are parked on both sides. I actually, I actually uh, printed off the picture, but I don't have it with me. Um, so I was when when the when the cars are parked on both sides. Basically, if a driver had to get out, yeah. You know, cars are going in between those cars. It's actually a, a safety risk of them getting out the car um, because it gets narrow with cars on both sides. Um, it's a multi-family unit or multiple multi-family units across the street, and they already park on this side of the street. Um, so, like I said, it gets narrow. Uh, the, the elevation, the elevation of this home, fits the aesthetic of the neighborhood. Uh, and will add value and without the front facing garage the value will actually decrease due to our limitations we are not choosing this for any re other reason than functionality a front facing ga garage will not pose a functional or a negative impact on the neighborhood so that's my case um i i actually wanted to bring up if i guess if i am denied i actually wanted to see I know we mentioned parking pads before this the court of ordinance looks like I would be able to put a parking pad I was wondering if I would be able to propose adding a like a modern carport in the front I actually have pictures of samples of this uh, carport that would uh, would help the home, home the future homeowner out and uh, what else did I say? We will have to put the parking pad there anyways because of the quarter ordinance. I already said that. Um, that's all I have. Mr. Crockett, how how wide is the lot? And can you tell me why it would be? Is it, is it wide enough to have a side facing garage? No, it's not. It's 37 feet wide. How wide would it have to be to have a side facing garage? I actually don't know. Yeah, more. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell me your minimum drive aisle is 12 feet? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the minimum drive is 12 feet, yeah. So, but that's just like from the street, it's 12 feet, and then you could widen it out after that. But it's, the house would have to be like extremely thin to do a side like a side garage like it's like shotgun pretty much okay thank you are there any questions for this applicant All right, seeing no questions, uh, so Mr. Crockett, do you have anything else to add at this point? Nope, that's all right now. Unless okay. someone wants to see these, uh, but so we'll wait for that. Afterwards. Okay, I'll close the public hearing and ask for uh, discussion. Any, any thoughts? And the, you know, this is a case, you know, we have heard the case, it is a landlocked um, property and there was some discussion at the last meeting of whether or not, uh, I think because the applicant had purchased the property along with uh, plans for the property um, and it was close to not being a buildable lot and I think that we had given a variance for it to do so and there was some issue as to whether or not the 
I think when the applicant bought the property, whether or not the plan was approved, which uh, was not the case, we didn't approve a specific plan. We just I think allowed the lot to be built upon. And so there was some question as to whether or not there could be a plan that was developed that would allow uh, for it to meet the R6A uh, zoning code. And I think some of the new information or, that we have today are, um, you know, if we didn't allow the um, front-facing garage, um, would it be acceptable to have a, a driveway and or a, a carport? Ms. Carpenter. Um, well, it's um, interesting that the neighborhood is not in favor of the front-facing garage, and that's what we're here to deliberate today. Um, I think the law is not exceptionally narrow, being 35, or I'm sorry, 37 feet wide, and a drive can fit um, next to the side of the house, um, which would alleviate uh, parking on the street. So I still don't see a reason to grant the variance for the garage to be front facing. Any other thoughts? Mr. Pepper. Well, it, it seems to me that this is not an issue of the, the, the uh, they're not being the ability to put a parking place on the property. It's just about the garage, as I understand it, that there can still be a parking pad. Is that a question for the code staff? No, that, I, that's, a, that's a question for the, I just want to make sure with other, the other members of the board that, that I understand that correctly. This is not a case in which if we deny this application that this, the, uh, applicant would not be able to park on the property. It's just that, mm -hmm. that you would not be able to park in a garage. I think that's right. Was that, was that Ms. Lamb? Yes. Yeah. Right, okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. So so Ms. Lamb, from your, your perspective, that would, um, for the applicant to build a driveway that had a, some type of off street parking would not require him to come back to us. I don't believe so. Okay. Okay, great. I mean, as we, we, it, uh, there's a provision that says parking driveways and all other impervious surfaces shall not exceed 12 feet. So he would be limited to 12 feet in width, but that does not indicate to me that he can't have them. Okay. Is there any other questions or information that folks need? Or any other comments? And or is there a motion? Ms. Carpenter. I guess I'll do it. Um, I will move to deny the variance request. Uh, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second. Is that Mr. Lawless? Lawless, Lawless. All right, seconded by Mr. Lawless. Um, I will, any other comments or thoughts? Uh, then we'll take a vote and start with Mr. Lawless. Mr. Aye. Lawless? Aye. Uh, yeah, aye. Mr. Pepper? Uh, I vote in favor of the motion. Ms. Carpenter? Uh, also in favor of the motion. Ms. Davis? I vote in favor of the motion. And I will also that motion passes. Mr. Chairman, before we move on to the next case on the to be heard, uh, I failed to call case 2020-082. This was previously heard at the last board meeting on April 2nd. Um, it was a request for a sidewalk variance. They, the applicant requested to contribute in lieu rather than building. Um, and there at that point, the no, no motion period for affirmative vote, so it stayed on the docket and it's back today um, for consideration if you want to make another motion or if make the same motion. Well, I'll, um, I guess the, 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 in order to have a, a motion, is it necessary to have a motion or can I just ask if, if anyone has changed their votes because all five of us were here and I can't I remember. 
I think either way, the motion that was left on the table or that failed to receive votes was a motion to allow them to contribute in lieu. That did not uh, carry four votes. So I think we can open it up if anyone has changed their vote um, or you can make the same motion and just see if anybody's changed their vote. That may be the cleanest way to do it. And I think, it, well, I think it only got two votes. <laughs> so it may have gotten three, but I think it only got two. Um, so, well, you know what, I'll, I will make that motion. If it gets a second, well, uh, we will hear the, we will vote. If it doesn't get a second, then we will move on. But I'll move that the applicant um, be allowed to pay the in lieu fee um, rather than build the sidewalk on this property. Ms. Carpenter, did you have a comment? Yes, I'll second. Okay, thank you. We have a motion and we have a second. Is there any other discussion? Uh, then we will vote and I'll start this time with Ms. Davis. I vote against the motion. Votes no. Ms. Karpinick? In favor. Uh, Mr. Pepper? Uh, I vote. My vote stays the same. I vote against. Okay, and Mr. Lawless? My vote stays the same against. Great. All right, so that motion fails to receive four votes and We'll stay on. I don't think it will make it. I think it's time runs out before the next meeting. Is that correct, Ms. Lamb? That's correct. The next meeting would be after the 30 day uh, time. So this one at that point would be deemed denied by operation of law. Okay, next case. Next case is case 2020-087. This is a request for a variance from lot size requirement to construct a single family residence. Before you is the zoning map showing the zoning of the property is R6. This that's is a second, I'm sorry, well, that's a second single family residence, right? They want to build two two homes on this lot. I'm sorry, yes, you're right. I, mis, I misread my docket so to, to build a second single family residence. Um, this is a zoning map showing you the zoning of the property is R6. Area photography showing you the surrounding area. This is the site plan that was submitted by the applicant. And finally, the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 87? Seeing none, the applicant will have five minutes to make your desired presentation. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. Good afternoon, my name is Haley Fry and this is for 1903 Cephas Street. Um, I wanna thank you for taking the time to review our case today. I know it's been a little bit crazy with everything and I hope everybody's staying safe. Um, I am asking for a variance to build a single family home behind the existing home on our already R6 zone property. The value of the property and surrounding properties will not diminish because of this. On the contrary, actually, it will create more density in the area without jeopardizing the city structure. This will give Metro a little more of what they need towards tax revenue and affordable housing. We had an appraisal done for both houses and learned that the value does not go down with a second dwelling on the property. I submitted a document with pictures showing just a few of the other two build lots in a two street radius. Within this radius, there are more than 32 build lots. There's also a real tracks page that shows the supply and demand in the area. As you know, North Nashville is one of the most up and coming areas in Nashville. My plan is to grow the economy and bring back housing, especially for people who may have lost their homes in the tornado. Even through this pandemic, closings in Nashville from last year to this year are up in this first quarter by 15%. That being said, the inventory of these closings are down from last year by 15.4% just in the first quarter. As you know, we are in a seller's market with inventory still dwindling. I think this is a great opportunity for us to contribute to the fast growth and change the Nashville economy. I have also had a few people on the same street that are fixing up houses that have called me to ask about the appeal as they would also like to help improve the neighborhood. There is a lot of change going on in the area and we wouldn't be asking for this if we thought that it would be, have a negative impact on the Buchanan Art District. I have tried to contact Mr. Taylor, our concept and council member for District 21 about eight times through phone and email, but have not had any success in getting a hold of him. I would have loved to discuss the reasons behind his letter. It is concerning a little bit because there wasn't any specific reason behind not having his support. With all of that being said, I would love to hear your thoughts and answer any questions you may have. I look forward to making the Buchanan Art District even better than it was before the tornado. Um, Ms. Fry, do you have a, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll ask uh, Ms. Lamb if you could, if, if it's possible to pull up the, you know, a, a map of the, the street just to see um, well, that, yeah, that either one of those is fine. I mean, you, you had mentioned that there were 32 build or 
I guess two home lots within a, a couple block radius. And I don't see any on this map. And one of the things that as the person responsible for determining the consent agenda and looking at um, lot size variances, you know, my rule of thumb has always been if, if you're um, reasonably close, which, you know, I think that this lot is, uh, in my opinion, reasonably close. The, the question I always ask is, do you get through this more than your neighbor, you know, or does this just bring you up to speed with your neighbor? Because sometimes there's a, an error in the, you know, in the, in the survey, or there might be, you know, one lot might be 51 and yours is 49 feet wide. And therefore, you know, you're off and all your neighbors are not. But when I looked at, at this case, it looked like all of your surrounding neighbors across the street and then to your left and to your right are all short of the square footage needed for a second home. So I'm curious to know um, how, you know, you say 30 within a two block radius, but then again on this map, none that touch the property would be eligible. And the, um, so I, yeah, and so the other, and I guess you mentioned your council member, but you talked about, I guess you have a letter of support, uh, but the council member talks about, you know, having, you know, that he had talked to several constituents and they're not in favor of the request, so he can't support it. So, and I know you addressed that, but can you talk about the support that you have and then um, where are the examples and how close are they actually to your property? Yes, sir. So the one guy that had called me, um, he called me about a week ago. He's actually the lot right next to us. If you're looking straight at the house, it's to the left. He is fixing up that house. Um, and it is, I'm guessing he's wanting to appeal. So he had asked about it um, to see how it was going with us because um, he would like to also put a second store or a second dwelling on it. There's also one at 1824 that I know um, was just sold to a investor who was also looking to do a two-build lot, which is uh, probably about five houses down on the other side of the street. Most of the two dwelling houses. Um, there how is how big is that lot? Is it eligible to build or is it not? It's the same size. So it's not eligible. He'd have to ask for a variance Correct. as well. All Correct. Right. It's about 250 feet short. Um, there is one double house dwelling on the end of Cephas, and most of the um, two house dwellings are on 12th and 11th. I believe. There's one, there's a street, there was ones we brought from 11th, 12th, and 14th Street that are all around it. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Are there any other, any questions for the applicant? All right, Ms. Fry, did you have anything else to add? No, I'm sir. Sorry, Mr. Pepper, did you have a question? No, I did not. Okay, I'm sorry. Your, your mute was off and I wasn't sure, sorry. Okay, I'm sorry, Ms. Fry, did you have anything else? No, sir. All right, uh, with nothing else to add, we'll close the public hearing and ask the board for their uh, thoughts. Uh, Ms. Davis. Um, as I reviewed the packet and listened to the testimony, I'm struggling to find a hardship. Um, I didn't hear anything sort of that's unique to the property that would justify it. And without a clear hardship, I couldn't support a motion for a variance and also in light of the council person's letter. Okay, uh, Mr. Pepper. Uh, sure, the, by my math, and somebody can check me on this, but by my math, there's just, there's a 4% shortage or a 4% deviation. And it's always been my opinion, I know not everybody agrees with it, but if you're, if you're within a few percentage points that um, you ought to get a variance. And um, by my calculation, again, there's just a 4% deviation. And I don't, I think that if Chairman Taylor, I know your, your concern is that you don't want one neighbor to have something others don't. And I understand that, but I think if, if other neighbors are within, let's say there's another neighbor within a 
and a 1% deviation, you know, I, I think they ought to get a variance too. And I do think, I'm not a surveyor, but I think there is some, I, I see in my work, I see where surveyors come up with different information. Um, and so what always concerns me is when you're talking about a slight deviation is, is, is that even within, you know, that, that may well be within the surveyor's uh, margin of error. So for that reason, I would um, support the application because again, by my math, it's 4%, so. Okay. Any any other thoughts or comments? Ms. Davis, did you have your hand up again or? No, I think it just never went down, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Any other thought? And and, and Mr. Pepper is right. I mean, you know, to me, it, it's within that that error range, and and I just I tend to look at it uh, as how does it compare? And in this case, you know, you it, if if um, I think I think supporting this really sets precedent for most of the street, and I d I have a tough time like Ms. Davis does supporting that with the council member, especially uh, not weighing in on that uh, favorably. So, that, I mean, that, um, and, and it's certainly an honest difference of opinion, but, but that's tend to how, how I tend to, to think about it. Are there, are there other thoughts, Ms. Davis? After you gather other thoughts, I'm ready to make a motion. I would say, unless someone raises their hand, how about it? I make a motion that we deny the variance as requested because of a lack of hardship. I'll second it. Uh, there's in the, was that Mr. Lawless? Yes, sir. There's a motion on the floor to uh, deny the variance, uh, seconded by Mr. Lawless, uh, made by Ms. Davis. Is there any discussion or comments on the motion? All right, seeing none, uh, we will vote Ms. Davis. I vote in favor of the motion. Uh, Ms. Karpenick? Uh, in favor. Mr. Pepper? Against. Mr. Lawless? Aye. Uh, and I will vote in favor so that motion passes four to one. Next case for the board to consider is case 2020-096. This is a property at 1525 Church Street, 112 and 116 16th Avenue North, 1500, 1502, 1504, 1506, 1511, 1512, 1520, 1521, and 1523 Hayes Street. Uh, Ms. Lee, yes. I'm sorry, just before we get started on this, I just want to uh, uh, let uh, Vice Chair Pepper know that I am recusing myself from uh, this case, and we'll turn that over to him, and we'll step out if you'll text me when you're done. I will join you all shortly. I will do it. So, Mr. Pepper, you are on board for this. The applicant is outside, socially distancing from outside of the room. Um, and we've gone out to advise them that their case is coming up. It may take them a minute or two to get in. Um, so we'll wait for them to get here and then I'll proceed with my presentation. And while we wait for them, I would one note I failed to mention earlier is that we do have Jessica Shepard here as um, one of our staff members keeping the clock. So for anyone who is watching or uh, from the public or for board members, we are keeping track of everyone's time. So the applicant is here now um, for this case. So we'll go ahead and proceed with the presentation. This is a request for special exception from height at the setback and within the slope control plane in the CF district to construct a mixed use development. This is the zoning map showing the zoning is CF. Um, and I would note for the um, board, the way the uh, software works, it only allowed me to highlight one parcel. So the parcel that is highlighted in red is part of it. And then you can see the black outline going down and then over and then up, you know, kind of a 
I wasn't ever very good at geometry, but funky shape, um, black outline, all of those parcels are the parcels that issue for this particular application. This is a zoning map, I'm sorry, the aerial photography zone showing you the photograph, aerial photograph from the property and surrounding areas. This is the site plan submitted by the applicant in terms of what would go there for this mixed use development. And finally, the current conditions of the property as well as up and down the street. Um, is there anyone present in opposition to this case? There is no one present, so the applicant will have five minutes to make the presentation. Um, and step up to the front podium and then make your desired presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Kim Hawkins with Hawkins Partners, Landscape Architects and Planners. This request. Uh, Ms. Hawkins, can I, can I interrupt you just a second? This is yeah. Mr. Pepper. Did, uh, my understanding was that your, your opposition wanted a deferral until May 7th, but now I understand they're not there. Is that and maybe Ms. Lamb, you can tell me what's going uh, on. Is the opposition had made a request until they 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 submitted something in opposition in writing for the board to consider in the event that you proceed with this case. As part of that um, letter they sent in, they requested a deferral. They didn't give a specific date. They just requested that it be deferred until it could be heard in person, so that they could make their their presentation or fully more fully explain their opposition in person. Ms. Hawkins, do you have a an objection? Does the applicant object to? continuing in this case to May 7th. And, and let me tell you, I have read, your opposition wants a chance to be heard in person, and I have read through the materials, and this is, you know, one of the more complicated cases that, that I have seen on the board. I think it would it would benefit all of the board members and the, the uh, parties involved for us to do this in person. Do you have a problem with that? Mm -hmm. Continuing until May 7th, deferring until May 7th? I'm gonna ask our legal counsel um, to address you. All right. Can you see me or just hear me? Just hear you. Oh, just hear me. James Weaver Waller Lanston uh, here today for the uh, for the applicant and uh, owners. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm, I'm 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 torn to to um, with regard to your request. I certainly understand the the, the thinking behind it. Uh, this is an extraordinarily important project. And, and one that has uh, um, time frames and deadlines uh, associated with it. Uh, the opposition had, um, not only did they have ample opportunity to interface with us and, and put their uh, objections in front, of the, uh, in front of the commission, but they, they have, the problem is their objection simply don't have anything to do with the requested special exception, uh, but it's got everything to do with their concerns about blocking their views and the competition that this site will bring to their project. And, and um, Mr. Weaver, is that a no? No, sir. No, I'm getting to that. Okay. <laughs> no, sir, that's not a no. Uh, it is a, um, uh, I think the issue is, is that uh, we have an application in front of the commission that we believe on its face. Uh, warrants the um, uh, the board uh, approving it. We've put uh, there's ample in information already in the record in front of you in the form of the letter that we uh, filed on Wednesday to support granting of the special exception. And and um, and while we understand the procedural um, uh, issue that's been raised by the opponent, frankly, we don't really see a. Um, uh, any way for them to, to refute the uncontroverted proof that we've put in front of you with regard to this really narrow special exception that we've asked for. Um, uh, if, the, if, the, if the chair, however, is, is requesting that we defer um, and knowing that we only have four members on the line, That's right. um, the, the one thing I have learned to do after all these years of doing this is count. <laughs> and um, I can't count very far, but I can count to four. And uh, so if it's your request, Mr. Chairman, that we defer for two weeks, we, we would, but we would, we would implore uh, the board that this is an extraordinarily important project for our city. Uh, it is, um, um, uh, it represents um, a, 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 a transformation, if one can have the transformation of Midtown from what it already is. Um, and we would um, 
absent uh, uh, absent a meteor hitting the city, uh, we would want to we would absolutely want to go in two weeks. And one thing I might just point out as the board considers this and for Mr. Weaver's own knowledge, um, at this point, we don't know if the May 7th meeting will be in person, so it may be appropriate to defer to that meeting. And then at that meeting, if it is another telephonic meeting, we can make well, a that's, determination. That's a great point. We would ask that the, that the, um, that we go for, that the opponent be informed that we're going on the 7th. Uh, I'm in person. I'm standing here. Um, my client's here. Our architects or engineers are here. Mr. Farrington and his client can get in their car and drive down here just like, there's no magic formula from my standpoint in staring Chairman Pepper in the face. He knows what I look like. He probably doesn't want to see me. Well, I think, I understand your points, Mr. Weaver. I think it'd be very helpful for us though with with the site plans and the materials we have to to, to be in person. So, I mean, it's not my, I'm not, it's, it is certainly my preference that we defer it till May 7th. And with the understanding that we're, we would vote again on May 7th, we could, we could hear it May 7th, we could vote to defer it. But what I'm going to do is make a motion right now so that the other members of this board can weigh in on it. It's not just my decision. So I'm, I'm going to move that we defer this case until the May 7th hearing. Second. That's lawless. Okay, so we have a motion and a second is, uh, would anybody like to discuss that? Mr. Pepper, this is Ashanti Davis. I just wanted to say that I thought um, the way you articulated your perspective that I agreed with, I agree with you and that I would support the motion. Okay, uh, anybody else? This is Tom Wallace. I just believe that uh, there needs to be a hard notice going to the people in opposition to this and that we will address it next time. Um, if that can be done. Uh, and I guess, Emily, that would be, I mean, all you can do is send a letter saying we're going to move forward or they've got the burden and they need to show up next time. We, we can certainly let them know that the board has made that request. Um, you know, I think in light of circumstances, you know, they're going to make the decision that they think is best for them, but we can certainly let them know that y'all have made the request that they appear to address them, to address you over the, uh, whether it's telephonically or at a live meeting that you've requested that they appear at the next meeting. Thank you, ma'am. And Mr. Lawless, your, your point is well taken. I, I think that, that we can also we can have a we can decide on May seventh whether we want to defer again then or we want to hear it that day and 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 board members may have differing opinions about that. So, um, but at any rate, is there, uh, Miss Davis, your hand is still up. Do you have uh, anything else to say on this motion? Well, just given the representations of the applicant of the importance of this project and the importance of it to the city, I think it is important to at least hear the opposition just because of his own representation of how important it is. Okay. All right. Um, anybody else before we vote? Okay, so the motion is that we defer until May 7th. Uh, there is a second. Oh, let me call the roll. Uh, Ms. Davis, how do you vote? I vote in support of the defer deferral. Okay, Ms. Karpinak? I'm in favor of the deferral. Okay, Mr. Lawless? I'm in favor of the motion. And this is Mr. Pepper and I'm in favor of it. So that case will be deferred until May the 7th. Uh, let me see if I can get in touch with Mr. Taylor and let him know that we're ready for him to come back in. And as soon as Mr. Taylor gets here, we will move on to the next case, which will be case 2019-100. I'm sorry, 2020-100. Who can forget what year it is after the kind of year it's been? All right, I'm, I'm here. All right, Mr. Chairman is back, so we'll proceed with case 2020-100 involving property at 202 43rd Avenue North. 
This is a request for a variance from rear setback requirements to construct a screened in porch on the rear of the structure. This is the zoning map showing the zoning of the property is RS 7.5. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. This is a site plan submitted by the applicant outlining the proposed screen porch. And finally, the photos from a recent site visit showing you the current conditions of the property as well as up and down the street. I don't see anyone else in the room, so I assume you are both here in support of this case. Yeah. Um, seeing no opposition, you'll have five minutes. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. Sure, this is Brian Youngerman. And Ellen Thomas. Of 202 43rd Avenue North. I'm here to answer any questions. I also am curious, did the photos that we submitted on the actual alley um, come Anything through? that you submitted before noon yesterday would be in the board's packet, which they have before them, but I don't have them. Okay, in the okay fantastic. Yeah, um, they are. Okay. They are included? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we're here to answer really any questions. Um, the proposition was to build a 16 by 16 uh, covered porch. Um, the hardship is that the lot was turned into a dual lot. Um, obviously, we are the unit B, um, and uh, that creates uh, an inability because of the thin structure of the lot uh, to put a uh, any any additional structure. Um, in this case, a, a screened-in porch mm -hmm. um, on the unit, except for uh, where it was proposed. Um, there are, as you'll note, in the picture submitted, as well as the neighborhood, uh, a number of existing structures uh, that go up to this point, as well as a little bit beyond uh, into the rear uh, setback uh, mm -hmm. requirements. Uh, those being full structures often uh, including um, fully insulated uh, garages uh, with dwelling units above them uh, and the like. Now, is your is your home does your home face Forty Third? Yes, sir. And you don't have a garage or a driveway. Uh, no, sir. We do have a one car garage and a one car driveway that is into the alley. Oh, I see. So that's on the side of the fence that you. Yes, sir. On the side of the fence that you. On the, on the other side of the fence. Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. I see that now. Well, one of the questions I had uh, when I looked at this was why a 16 by 16 and why couldn't it be a little narrower and longer? But I didn't see the uh, it, the site plan you all submitted. The driveway is very faint, and so I didn't um, know that, uh, that the driveway prohibited uh, the deck to actually, uh, or the, the covered porch to be. Yes, sir. Correct. It can't extend into the driveway, as you, as you just noted. And is this this porch you're proposing is, is a screened-in porch? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, it would be a, a covered uh, porch that would have screen curtains, uh, so not, uh, I guess, fully permanent screens. I'm not sure. Screen. Yeah, but it, it, you don't have an intent to enclose the porch? No, sir. And, and wouldn't be opposed if we were to approve this with a condition that it would not be enclosed? Yes, sir. That that is. There's no opposition from our side on that. Our intent is to have, just have a uh, <clears throat> shade within the uh, backyard. And then, how close to the alley? You said the red line. Uh, it looked like it was going to be four feet, but the red line uh, looks a lot further than four feet. Yes, sir. So that's a very good point. Um, our uh, general contractor had it pinged at actually uh, 11 feet, 11 to 12 feet. Um, the way that uh, it's unclear to us as far as uh, I guess the property line extends uh, a little bit shorter than that alley. 
um, and therefore, and they're six feet from our current fence to the alley, um, and this would be an additional uh, an additional five feet before that. So you're saying you, in reality, you'd actually be 11 feet off the yes. alley proper? Yes, sir. That's okay. Correct. All right, that's good to know. Again, something else that wasn't clear um, exactly on the site plan, but thank you for, for clarifying that. Absolutely. Are there any questions for the applicant? I'm sorry, uh, do you all have anything else to add at this point? Uh, no, I, I think the, um, <laughs> if this uh, is request is denied, um, like consideration for an open roof structure instead uh, with a lattice. Um, so, and I don't, I don't know if that would need to get approved or if we go through this process or not, but that would okay. be our question. Okay, then uh, we will close the public hearing um, and ask for discussion. You know, one of, uh, one of the two things that weren't clear to me when I saw the original site plan were the, uh, often the alley is, is kind of at the property line and, and I didn't know that there was an additional six feet there. Uh, and I didn't know there was a driveway because it wasn't clear to me on the site plan. And so, uh, you know, given the density, you know, the neighboring density cl that close to the alley, um, you know, I, I don't personally have a, a problem, um, a problem with it, um, especially if it's a screen, uh, some type of open air, potentially screen porch that's not gonna be enclosed. But what, what, is, what does everybody else think? Ms. Karpinek? I'll have to say I'm having trouble with the hand, making, um, raising the hand, it always gets lost on the screen. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry for my slowness sometimes. Um, you know, I'm looking at this, it's almost the way the house is oriented towards 43rd. Um, the alley is almost um, like a side setback, the way um, the unit is oriented. It's hard for me to kind of explain that in words, but um, this kind of seems to me like the porch would really be under a side setback um, condition in which usually for residential of this size, it might be five, a five foot setback or um, it'd be less than a 20 foot setback. So I think for that reason, it's a, it, the request is acceptable. And even if it were a 10 foot setback, it would, it wouldn't meet 10 feet um, literally, but it would meet it conceptually with the current location of the alley. Right, and I'll also say there's other structures in the alley that are, or that line the alley that get pretty darn close to the alley as well. Right. Any so other? That's helpful that the applicant provided. Okay, uh, Mr. Lawless. Do I take that, Christina, as a motion on your part? Sure, I will make that motion. <laughs> then I would second it. <laughs> Okay, sounds good. All right, there's a motion on the floor to um, approve the variance as requested. Um, and Ms. Carpenter, does that include the condition that the porch not be enclosed for uh, heating and air? Yes, that's, that's a good um, amendment to it. And Mr. Lawless, is that acceptable? Absolutely. Okay, there's a motion on the floor, there's a second. Is there any other discussion on the motion? All right, uh, we'll take a vote. Mr. Lawless. Aye. Mr. Aye. Pepper. Aye for Mr. Pepper. Ms. Karpenick. Uh, in favor. Ms. Davis. In favor. And I'll vote in favor also that motion passes five to zero. Good luck. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right, last case of the day. Last case of the day is case 2021 -06. This is a uh, involving property at Six Peach Blossom Square. I don't see the applicant in the room. If you'll give me one minute, I'll step outside, make sure he's not outside. Great.
Mr. Chairman, I did not see him outside, so I will defer to the board whether you want to um, defer this case to another meeting or how you want to handle it. Um, I'll move that we defer this case uh, to the next meeting uh, based on kind of the extraordinary circumstances we're in. I'll second the motion. Uh, Mr. Seconded by Mr. Lawless. Um, we'll take a roll call on that unless there's any discussion. Ms. Davis? I vote in support of the motion. Ms. Karpinek? Ms. Carpenter. <laughs> I'm sorry, did you hear me? It's uh, in favor, sorry. All right, no, no worries. Mr. Pepper? In favor. And Mr. Lawless? Aye. And I vote yes also, so that uh, passes five to nothing. That is deferred. These have been the shortest meetings we've ever had. That's right. Uh, so that concludes the April 16th, 2020 meeting of the Board of Zoning Appeals. All right, stay safe, everybody, and we will see you in a couple of weeks. See you then. See you, everybody. Thank See you, guys. Thanks. Be Bye. good. Be safe. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.